Hello students, welcome to lecture 5. In this lecture, we will take a closer look at the origin of electroencephalographic signal and simple uh, generation procedure or mechanism. The outline of today's lecture is as follows. First, we will review again excitatory postsynaptic potentials and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials generated in uh, postsynapse. EEG's genesis, uh, different ways to acquire brain signals, and we will go uh, briefly revisit challenges in PCI. In the previous lecture, we have seen some brain structures and its corresponding functions. And we also have briefly discussed about EPSP, IPSP. So, EPSP, also known as excitatory postsynaptic potentials, represent that the excite excitatory synapse cause, cause the postsynaptic cell to become less negative. So, this is a cell presynapse, this is synapse, presynaptic neuron. Okay, this is postsynaptic um, neuron. So, the membrane of this postsynaptic cell or neuron become less negative and this is associated with increases increase the likelihood of firing an uh, action potential so if we have a, a lot of EPSP okay then we will have most likely uh, action potential while IPSP inhibitory postsynaptic potentials Okay, in, in this case, inhibitory synapses cause inhibitory synapse cause the postsynaptic um, sorry neuron or cell potential to become negative, triggering an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. This in turn decreases the likelihood of firing an action potential. Okay, so this uh, IPSP cause the postsynaptic cell to become more negative while EPSP it causes postsynaptic cell to become less negative more negative right so EPSP less negative IPSP more negative this is the cell uh, neurons neuron uh, um, cell body axon hillock and we have axon all right so what is the action potential Again, it's a rapid, transient, all or non-nerve impu impulses, which can be uh, measured at axon or axon hillock. Okay, the, the amplitude of this nerve impulse is around 100 microvolt approximately. And the duration is around one millisecond. Okay, the duration, this is an example of action potential. That flow from the body of the neuron to the axon terminal, which is uh, here, right? Through the uh, axon, all right? So if we have AB, AB, okay, more it increases likelihood of fine action potential if it passes some certain threshold. While C, IPSP, will decrease, okay, the you know, put, uh, probability or likelihood, likelihood of fine action potential. So AB, when two neurons fire together previous, and when two, uh, um, uh, we have postsynaptic potential here, then they sum up temporally and spatially, and then while EPSP uh, decreases it. Postsynaptic potentials represent the origin of EEG that is recorded from the skull. So let me explain you point by point the entire process. So here we have sending neuron, receiving neuron. We have uh, synapse and synaptic uh, cleft axon. We have action potential traveling from, from this sending neuron to receiving one. All right, and then we're talking about the depolarization or polarization of postsynaptic membrane after this synapse. So, in five steps, when action potential reaches the axon terminal, okay, this is axon uh, terminal, 
the neuron releases neurotransmitters. So, okay. Second, the neurotransmitter binds to receptor. This is the receptor. And then the postsynaptic neuron gets depolarized or polarized or hyperpolarized, okay, depending on the um, type of ion. Uh, so it generates, if it is depolarized, we can relate it to EPSP. While it, if it is hyperpolarized, then it will be uh, equivalent to the inhibitory process. So EPSP will make the postsynaptic membrane less negative. IPSP makes the membrane more negative to become more negative which in turn causes uh, the the likelihood of uh, action potential so for so epsp and then ipsp they sum temporally and spatially okay so temporally relates to uh temporally relates to firing of different neurons sending neurons at the same time at the same exact time if we have EPSP and IPSP synapses at the same time happening, then uh, they will sum temporally. And also spatially means, again, we have a lot of uh, neurons, sending neurons, right? And then they sum spatially, so in this case. So if we assume this line as a basic resting potential without the cause of any uh, EPSP, IPSP, then they sum if two EPSP comes and uh, they start summing IPSP maybe and then when we have thousands of neurons firing and causing inhibitory excitatory postsynaptic potential then it reaches some threshold and the action potential is created okay given that the postsynaptic neuron reaches the certain threshold depolarization threshold and then action potential is carried to the next neuron, right? So what we see here in this slide is, okay, each electrode that measures voltage difference is placed on top of the skull. This is skin, scalp, this is skull or skull, this is bone, dura matter, and some other uh, matters, PR and other. So uh, right under these layers, we have these neurons oriented in a perpendicular to the surface of the, the brain all right and this is the cell body and then depolarization is the axon the dendrite so when EPSP is generated in the dendrites of a neuron okay here an extracellular electrode detects a negative voltage difference resulting from uh, currents flowing inside the neurons cytoplasm the cytoplasm is a clear fluid within the neuron it it just uh, the one part of the neuron which composes a bulk of uh, cellular materials which provides a suspension medium for free floating uh, molecules and any plus stands for sodium right sodium currents flow inside the neurons cytoplasm this is basically just a small fluid and the current completes the loop further away from the excitatory input, sodium flows outside the cell, and being recorded as a positive voltage difference by extracellular electrode. And this process can last uh, hundreds of milliseconds, while in comparison, action potential lasts very just one millisecond around. So this entire process of sodium currents flow inside neuron right creates a dipole okay a very small dipole that can be detected by external electrode so if you look at the microscopic image or so-called pyramidal neurons and in general brain surface cortex surface we have a layered structure so this layer one two three four five six so six is a deep layers deeper layers from the surface of the cortex this is the brain surface and most of the 
uh, easy activities are recorded from layer one. And these layers are called pyramidal neurons. They are spatially aligned, spatially, and perpendicular to the cortical surface as I mentioned. And the EEG data represents uh, mainly the postsynaptic potentials of pyramidal neurons, which is closer to the surface of the cortex of the brain. And uh, the recording of the electrodes. While the activities of these deeper neurons gets dispersed and attenuated by volume conduction effects. So volume conduction effect is, uh, we'll, we will cover that later in the coming lectures. Basically, uh, it gets attenuated by several, due to the uh, several layer structure of our skulls, skin, and dura matter and other matter. So we have different ways to measure brain activities. And all of them represent, uh, in this case, electrical and brain activities. Electrical because of the, the uh, polarization, depolarization that's related to, to membrane potential change, right? So EEG is recorded by placing electrode on the, the surface of the skull, ECOG on top of the um, cortex, or without penetrating the cortex, we call it ECOG or electrocardiogram. And more deep invasive ones are called intracranial microarrays. So those microelectrodes penetrate the brain tissue. This is the surface of the brain. Okay, so scalp, this is uh, uh, the approximate length of the scalp and skull, including other matter. So it's around 12 millimeters. And then the cortex of um, the surface of the cortex, which most of the neurons allocated is four millimeters. This is the gray matter, so-called gray matter of the brain. So a lot of functions are happening here. While uh, under the brain, we have white matter. Right? So here we can take a look at sample EEG signals recorded from the surface of our skull, right, of our head. It's a totally non-invasive way of measuring brain activities. While ECOG, intracranial, microarray recordings are called invasive because it has to go through this uh, skull skull you need to penetrate our body so here again so EEG signal they look like um, complex sinusoidal signals each pattern here represents one specific area of the brain and we also have power spectral density with some clear prototypical examples decibel and then this is the, from 0 to 40 hertz. Most of the interest in brain activities that we can analyze in EEG signals are located from 0 to 40 hertz. Okay, uh, and this is time series data, is sometimes, most of the time, called channel. Okay, one, one electrode recording corresponds to one channel. So if I say CZ channel, this is the central channel, and each has some labeling, like uh, frontal channel and some some other frontal electrodes. So, and here um, we have one example of topographic image of these, for instance, this time window, average, and uh, the amplitude values are visualized like this as a color code. This gives us some spatial information also. More red areas, for instance, can correspond to more increased activity in that part of the brain. Okay, this is, again, uh, non-invasively acquired data visualization. So spectrum of EEG has some clear patterns, such as alpha, beta, and gamma waves. So this is a uh, power and then frequency. As I said, most of the interesting activities have happened between 0 and 40 hertz. And this line represents 1 over F, so-called pink noise. This is uh, present in the EEG data, always. So it has a ratio 1 over F. It's different from uh, so-called white noise that you can see here. They kind of correlate with the power spectrum of EEG. So alpha, beta, and then gamma. Okay, so 
um, this alpha band, for instance, corresponds to some uh, brain activity, as for Mentor said, beta band can be related to some other in gamma. And uh, from the previous lecture, if you remember, we just went through very general description of different brain structure, brain parts, and their function. In BCI research, we need to know those uh, higher level knowledge of what part of the brain is responsible for what. And most BCI research is data driven. We acquire data from some a part of the brain, for instance, core motor or sensory motor cortex, and, and then uh, record, for instance, frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal lobe, and uh, this is our called somatosensory cortex. So we place electrodes like this. All right, so AF7, PFP1, we, uh, <coughs> we use some kind of convention in labeling the sensor location. So these are the sensors placed on top of the head or skull. Occipital O stands for O, occipital. O1 stands odd numbers located on the left hemisphere. Okay, this is nose, this is um, center. Odd number 77533, seven, seven, okay, represents left hemisphere. And then the even numbers, that is uh, bound with some letters, represents right hemisphere. Okay, if you see some data correspond to C6 channel, you should be able to understand, oh, okay, this data comes from this part of the uh, hemisphere and then this location. So, occipital, PO stands for Pareto occipital. So, this is around here. Both regions intersect, okay? The parietal occipital, parietal occipital, Z stands for the center. You see Z, 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 Z. So FBZ, FZ, FCZ, CZ, CPZ, and etc. OZ. So really at the center or between right and left hemisphere. Parietal occipital, parietal occipital center, parietal occipital uh, right hemisphere, right side, and parietal. Okay, so blue. Parietal, uh, right side, left side. TP stands for Temporal, temporal parietal, okay, somewhere here, temporal parietal, intersection between two. T stands for temporal, FT stands for uh, somewhere here, frontal temporal. C, all these C stands for central, 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 okay, frontal center, frontal central, and this yellow stands for, for electrodes, of course, recorded from frontal, 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 okay. AF stands for anterior frontal, anterior frontal, FP frontal, frontal. So all of these channels uh, acquired using each sales system have this kind of labeling, right? Um, we should memorize or just uh, remember these kind of system that we use for labeling electrodes or sensors or data acquired from uh, these channels. We also call them as channels. CZ channel, TA channel, okay? FA channel something uh, like, for instance, F, P, P, O. Now, <coughs> so most of the interesting uh, data in BCI research comes from somatic sensory, somatosensory area, which is located uh, in the middle of, uh, in the central area of the brain. C1, CZ, C3. Because one of the aim of BCI or BMI research is to help people to restore their lost functions, motor functions, such as um, moving again, uh, okay, restoring the hand movement for patients who have the stroke disorder, for instance, or generally for paralyzed people. Most of the uh, functions associated with those motor movements are located in this area. And even neuroscientists have provided us mapping. For instance, just take the slice of this part of the brain and we can map. So leg movement, whenever you walk or move your leg, this part of the brain activate. So it's around here. Okay, when you move, run, or play soccer, most of the time this part of the brain is activated. And hip, trunk, okay, trunk is and head, neck, for instance, most of these are located here. So hand movement or the, the brain part is possible for hand movement is located here. So left hand, right hand. So left hand movement uh, related areas are located on the right hemisphere, while right hand related uh, 
a part of the brain, okay, in uh, somatic sense we call it rotator cuff. So that means our uh, left uh, somatic sensory cortex controls uh, the right side, okay, while left, I mean for right uh, part of the brain controls the left uh, uh, side of the, or well, left hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, also tongue, for instance, you want to uh, analyze uh, hand movement data, for instance, the root. Then you, you place electrodes, you put data from experiment and try to extract these features. One of the prominent example of patterns that can be recorded in EEG from the brain is uh, called as alpha rhythm and mu rhythm. Okay, for example, alpha rhythm corresponds to data that is happening around 10 Hertz in the visual cortex. This is all the occipital Z, right, center, the visual cortex. What happens? So most of the time, our brain are in idle uh, state. Most of the rhythms in the brain are idle uh, rhythm. And uh, they are attenuated during activation. So for instance, if you close your eye, and if you put electrode, first, if you put electrode on your visual cortex, and record data in two conditions. First, closed eyes, open eyes. So if you record the closed eye data, so it will have, um, the EEG signal pattern with a 10 hertz, around 10 hertz, okay? It's a little bit subject specific, but 10, 12, between 9 and 10, with increased amplitude. Okay, as you can. And if you open your eyes at the same time, then we will, see, we will observe decrease in the amplitude, but the underlying frequency will remain the same. You see, so um, <coughs> what can we say about this? So when, when you see something, some information coming to you through your eyes, the visual cortex will try to process. And this processing is somehow in EEG is reflected by the increase of the signal amplitudes. And uh, one of our tasks would be to answer the question why, or trying to interpret this, why this happens. And another more interesting uh, rhythm is called mu rhythm. This is most relevant to PCI BMI research also happening in around 10 Hertz all right <coughs> however the location of mu rhythm is in central area okay while well, this one is OZ so what happens in motor and sensor cortex imagine you record we place electrode here and then record data in two conditions first your arm at rest idle state we can observe these signals and if you just move your arm, okay, do anything, just move, we will observe uh, attenuation or reduction in the amplitude of this signal. So if we consider this as a rest state, this is active state, then when you move your arm, okay, increase in uh, data can be observed. So we use this kind of features for classification, for decoding of our machine learning BCI. So we already have some two state data, two class classification, for instance, arm at rest versus arm moves. You construct feature vectors, you train your machine learning algorithm in BCI and then try to uh, use them as external comments. Well, we'll talk about that later. And um, this, uh, again, this is called a sensor motor rhythm space BCI, which we have seen in the introductory lectures. So if you put these two electrodes on sensor cortex, sensor motor cortex, okay, in the area of our brain responsible, around here okay if you put sensors and then ask the participant to imagine left versus right hand movement and record data again you see I, as I mentioned FZ stands for frontal Z central CZ central exactly here PZ is occipital central OZ is uh, PZ is uh, sorry parietal OZ is occipital right so if you record data and then analyze we can observe these kind of uh, act patterns, topographic image. These crosses are electrodes, location, spatial location of electrodes, right? And the more uh, negative means, uh, more blue means some activation pattern. So if you or someone imagines left hand movement, we, we should see activation pattern on the right hemisphere, right side of the brain. This is nose, right. Right hand in movement imagination gives us activation patterns or some interesting patterns on the left hand side okay so the task is to just to 
extract different features between two classes left versus right and control some BCI applications or BMI applications right yeah so this again looks simple but there are some challenges I already uh, mentioned uh, about nine challenges in the previous lectures and now uh, I just want to revisit some of the more important challenges uh, in this lecture again for instance um, so generation of EEG signals I told you the pyramidal neurons are responsible for generating EEG signals and most of the inf uh, information or neuron activity is coming from this very tiny slice I mean all of the um, brain surface cortex these are gray matters most the neurons are located here and these are white matters these white matters are kind of can be imagined highways between different parts of the brain connecting them but most of the neurons is located here okay, this is cortex and the EEG signal is recorded from surface scalp skull cerebrospinal fluid which is uh, located here so <clears throat> first problem is called uh, volume conduction problem or volume conduction effects in EEG because the electrical field should um, travel through these different um, layers of CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, skull, and skull. And then each part has some conductivity values, conductivity of electrical activities. So while this tissue, for instance, if we uh, assume that source of our brain activity is located here, the tissue conductivity is quite good. However, the skull attenuates. It filters out most of the interesting information, most of the interesting data. All right. So, and this attenuation is called as uh, a conduction effect, conduction of, of electrical field, volume conduction. All right. And then we can record the same activity by placing a different uh, part of the brain. So that somehow uh, each electrode is measuring. Uh, very highly correlated data. <coughs> Which can be seen in this uh, figure. All right, this is uh, the correlation map between each uh, each of the channel with the central CZ channel. Correlation that range from one, zero to one. More red means highly correlation, more correlation. All right, so these are raw EEG skull potentials are known to be associated with a large spatial scale owing to volume conduction. Yeah, so we have, uh, we also call it as spatial smearing, mind spatial smearing. So yeah, to address these kind of uh, problems, we can use uh, spatial filters that minimize the correlation between different channels. So this one, subject-to-subject uh, -subject variability, is one of the biggest challenges which I mentioned earlier in analyzing brain data. Right? So if, uh, if we record data corresponding to same mental task from different subjects, we can see different variation in the distribution of the EEG data. So for instance, here we have data recorded from 30 subjects, 30 human subjects, from left and right hand imagination experiments. So these two correspond to one subject, another, 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 another. This one is also doing the same experiment, the same mental uh, task. So we can visually spot that there are inter-subject variabilities, so subject to subject variability. This data coming from this subject is highly variable from this subject or this one is different from this, right? This data is different from this, or this, or this. So it is very, very uh, highly variable. So this, that could mean in the uh, context of the brain machine interfaces, we need to deal with the subject specific data set. We need to account for these kind of variabilities. I like the analogy of fingerprint. While fingerprint is very, very unique, right? But Similar to fingerprint, brain data between different subjects are different. But of course, there are uh, some similarities, but it's not as different as unique as fingerprints. But just imagine, so we have very um, different brain patterns. So we have subject to subject variability, 
and also session for session variability. Okay. And I believe we have seen this topographic distribution of the um, EEG data. So if you record data from one subject, that corresponds to left-hand imagination and right-hand imagination across five different sessions. Okay, then you see this kind of pattern. So I'm imagining left-hand movement, session one or day one. I have this pattern. Day two, a different pattern. Day three, different pattern, or session three. Day session four, session five. So the data coming from my brain across different sessions is highly variable. This is a big problem for uh, most PCI systems, PMI systems, that use or that assume that data, or, or the decoders or classifiers or PCI system assume that the data generated is according to identical independent distribution rule. So at least we assume that the data is generated identically no, and independent. All right, this is another big challenge. And we have third is trial to trial variability. This is even worse. Same day, okay, but different uh, data distribution across different trials. Left hand imagination, imaginary trials, trial one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, from the same subject. Left, right hand. Do you see any similarities visually? In the distribution of these uh, EEG data. Hmm? No, it's very, very hard because the distribution of these topography units are different. Again, uh, these are the example, I mean, these color coded examples are, or we can call them as a heat map, represents the, the power or amplitude value of the EEG signal interpolated on this, this um, scalp or topography as an image. And Finally, okay, our brain is so active simultaneously, hyperactive. When we, okay, we have different parts of the brain, as we have seen, responsible for different uh, actions for, uh, or represent different functions. If you are, uh, for instance, generating verbs, this part of the brain is active, speaking, uh, hearing words, or seeing words, right? So uh, we have different parts of the brain uh, active simultaneously. And then extracting the command, for instance, related to right-hand, left-hand imagination, is another challenge. We need to extract that as a um, signal or feature of interest from the remaining data set that can correspond to different uh, simultaneously occurring functions of the brain. So yeah, those variabilities somehow can be minimized or can be handled using some machine learning uh, algorithm techniques or adaptive signal processing. However, uh, still, they pose a, uh, the biggest problem, biggest challenge. So here we can see some examples of uh, machine learning uh, calibration and then feedback uh, to stages. So in the calibration, we acquire continuous data from the brain and we segment around time markers that correspond to the time window where the subject performed some mental mental task, imagined right hand, imagined uh, left hand, etc. We can sort of construct feature vectors out of these uh, segmented data, okay? And then we apply a ch uh, classifier of our choice. If this is a left hand, right hand imagination task, then yeah, we are dealing with a binary classification task, right? And during the calibration, uh, we estimate our function or learning algorithm, F, and we take that F to the feedback application or online okay we apply this uh, function let's call it linear function in real time and then try to estimate what the subject or what the subject is thinking or trying to uh, imagine okay okay here in this stage we have labels because we segment and provide labels we know uh, the labels of this task but in real time case we don't know the label or the target value we have some data, we just use that or a calibrated learning algorithm and then estimate uh, which part of this a decision boundary falls to left hand or right hand imagination for instance. So we will have uh, man, uh, many hands-on sessions on machine learning uh, using EEG data in the coming lectures and we will go off through all these steps of segment, acquiring data, segment, segmenting it into 
trials and then uh, constructing feature vectors training the algorithm and then using that algorithm in a uh, pseudo online application or hopefully one day in our lab okay i think that's it for today if you have questions please let me know thank you for your uh, attention